Hi class, Dr. Jim here. Chapter 15, so we're now on to looking at the acquired or adaptive immunity. And so it really has these two names because what happens in this situation is that you acquire this immunity over your lifetime and it adapts to what you're exposed to. So that's where we really get those two names. Now they can be referred to either one, but really this involves the third line of defense. So in the previous chapter, chapter 14, we talked about the innate immunity in which it was Again, the mechanical barriers and then your white blood cells that do the phagocytosis, inflammation, and some other things. Today in this lecture, what we're looking at is the acquired adaptive, and this involves the B cells and the T cells. What makes this different than the innate immunity is, one, you have specificity. So each B cell responds and T cell responds to a different antigen, and we'll talk about what antigens are, but think of basically pieces of the pathogen. And so you can have multiple antigens on one pathogen or one bacteria or one virus, but you can also have multiple antigens on multiple things. And so again, those B cells all respond to a different antigen and your T cells all respond to a different antigen. So there's lots of specificity that goes on. And so think of one B cell for each antigen that's out there. And there are millions of different antigens, not if maybe not billions of antigens out there. Okay. The other thing that we see is that you have memory and memory is very important. When you are exposed to something, you make memory to it. And that is one of the cool things about the adaptive or acquired immunity is that when you come in contact with something, you are now protected for the rest of your life because you now make B and T cells that will remember what you were exposed to. Now, probably some of you are thinking, well, how come I get a cold every year? Or how come if I get the flu once, I'm not protected and I have to get a flu shot every year? There are reasons for that. And again, the pathogens themselves can change, they can modify, they can mutate. The other thing is, is you have to remember that each antigen is different. And so you may respond with a B cell that is for that antigen, the next time you come in contact with that same pathogen again, it might have a different antigen on it that now your B and T cells can't recognize. And so you go through the process again. And so that's why a lot of times we have to be either revaccinated with things or sometimes there's it's an impossibility to be vaccinated for things because you constantly have this antigenic change in these pathogens. And we'll talk a little bit about that with vaccines and a number of other things as we go along. Okay, so the two things to remember today specificity and memory and that makes the acquired or adaptive immunity so important so let's look at the third line of defense so first thing is obviously we're going to talk about what is the third line of defense and i've already spent a few minutes talking about that and what makes it different and again the two things specificity and memory what are the b cells so we'll talk a little bit about the b cells so think of b cells bone marrow that's where they mature that's why they're called the b cells and what are the receptors and what do they attack and so we're going to look at the receptors of b cells we refer to those as antibodies and they go after antigens okay so antigens and antibodies and then we'll see this again and again not only in this chapter but in the next chapter chapter 16. We'll talk a little bit about T cells. T cells are called T cells because they mature in the thymus, and that's why they're called T cells. And th the thymus is a little gland that sits kind of right above your heart. And then when you're a baby, it's very large. And as you get older and older and older, it shrinks in size. And that is a primary lymphoid organ. So if you remember chapter 14, talked about primary versus secondary. Well, the thymus and the bone marrow are two primary. And so that's because those cells mature there, okay? We'll talk about the cell types and what do they attack. There are two types of T cells. Actually, there are three, but we're only going to talk about two types of T cells today. We're going to talk about the helper T cells, which help with the response. And then we'll talk about the cytotoxic T cells, which actually go and kill cells with their response. Okay, so those are the two. And then finally, we'll look at what is immunity and then why do we need vaccines. And so there's going to be something that we see in the middle of this, and I won't spoil the fun, but we'll see this response. And part of the reason why we get vaccinated for things is to kind of preempt this response so that we don't have to go through the primary and we set up the secondary response. So that's going to be very important. So when we start talking about that, you'll see that. Okay, so that's what we're looking at today. All right, so again, the third line of defense is called the acquired immunity. And so again, the acquired immunity is one of those things where you acquire over your lifetime. So every exposure you have to a different disease or pathogen 
or virus or bacteria is going to give you some type of immunity or response to. And so when we get these infections and pathogens and other things exposed to us, we develop an acquired immune system. Okay, and that's the idea. It's a dual system of your BNT cells and it provides immunocompetence. Once you see it, you become competent to it. Okay. The antigen is a molecule that stimulates a response by the T or, T or B cells. Okay. And so anytime you get a response by your T and B cells, we call that thing an antigen. So think of pathogen. Antigen can kind of be loosely associated because pathogens have antigens and all antigens are pieces of the pathogen. So that's kind of where that comes from. And again, the two features of this is the specificity. So remember, each B and T cell you have are specific for each type of antigen. So again, specificity, one type of cell for each type of antigen. So you have one receptor for each antigen that's out there. And so you can have millions of different B and T cells. The other thing is memory. Memory is a huge thing because every time you get exposed to something or get a vaccine, you develop those B and T cells to remember what they saw. And so it's kind of this whole game of, did you see it? If you see it and make a response, you remember it, and now you have it for the rest of your life. So we'll talk about that as well. Okay, so specificity and memory are the important things about the third line. All right, so let's look at the overall specific immune responses. So again, these are separate but related activities of the specific uh, response. First, you have development and differentiation of the immune system. And so this is developing all the different DNT cells that you have throughout your lifetime. And again, some of them get responded to. Some of them through your life will never be responded to. And that's just because what you get exposed to and what you don't get exposed to. And so again, you develop these responses over your lifetime. And sometimes you get a lot of response and other times you get no response. Okay. You get lymphocytes and antigen processing. And again, this is the lymphocytes, the B and T cells responding to the antigen when they see it. You get a cooperation between the lymphocytes and the antigen presentation. And again, this is where the macrophages play a huge role and they present what they ate to the B and T cells. Okay, you have the B lymphocytes and the production of antibodies. And then you have the T lymphocyte responses. And again, that's the T helper cells and the cytotoxic T cells. The one I'm not talking about today is the T regulatory cells, and that's a whole other ballgame. So we won't even bother with that today. But like I said, immunology is very complex and, and that, and we can look at those at a later date. If you do have questions about that, I can definitely talk about that. But for today, we'll just keep it simple and think of the helper Ts and the cytotoxic T cells. All right, so if we look at the immune system, this is how essentially it happens. So first you have the development of your B and T cells. And again, the B cell lines develop in your bone marrow and they get maturation, which means they get their antibodies or receptors on their cells in the bone marrow. These guys leave the bone marrow once they become mature, once they grade in the receptors, and then they go and sit in the lymph node. And that kind of states their first part. Okay, so they stay in the lymph node. The second thing that happens is with the T cells. T cells develop in the bone marrow, but then they leave the bone marrow before they get receptors and go to the thymus. They become mature or gain their receptors in the thymus, and then they go to the lymph node to kind of sit and wait out. Now, again, you have, you know, hundreds of lymph nodes throughout your body. And again, you have millions of B and T cells that are scattered throughout. And so these guys set up in these different spots. Not only do you have the lymph nodes, but you have your tonsils, you have your spleen, you have some of these other areas that are associated with uh, lymphoid tissue. And so all these things are loaded with these different BNT cells once they're mature. Okay. So now they're just kind of sitting and waiting. Once they get mat maturation, they're kind of just sitting and waiting, ready to respond. Once an antigen, a piece of the a piece of the bacteria or virus comes in and comes in contact with the B cell or T cell, Again, then they get activated. So once they respond and they have specificity towards that antigen, they respond to that and you get an activated B cell. Once they become activated, one, you make memory cells that will remember that antigen that they come in contact with. And these are long-term cells. So these go on for many years, okay? Other cells become factories and these factories produce lots and lots of antibodies. And so these little factories we call plasma cells produce lots and lots of antibody that gets released into your bloodstream. And those things look for antigens, bind them up and get rid of them. And we'll talk a little bit about this. I have a nice little movie to show you guys how that all works. And that's how the B cells respond. 
So the B cells, they bind to antigen. Once they find that antigen, they make memory cells and they make plasma cells, which produce more and more antibody. And we'll talk about that as we go along. In the T cells, the T cells work very similarly. However, they have to be presented to. They get presented to by the macrophages. And once they become activated, they make activated T cells and some of them become memory cells. Others become cytotoxic T cells. Others become helper cells that help the B cells respond. And so you'll see a lot of different things. And so we'll, again, we'll talk a little bit about how T cells mature, how they become activated and what happens on there. So you have two different types of T cells, the helper T's, which help present to the B cells and other T cells. And then you also have the cytotoxic T cells, which go in and kill cells. So those are the different things that you'll see, okay? All right, so let's look at the development of their immune response. And so again, the major functions of your receptors are to perceive and attach a cell to foreign molecules. So it's looking for foreign things. Also to promote the recognition of self. You don't want your cells to attack yourself. So there's a way that that happens as well. So we know what we are and or what our cells are versus what is foreign. Okay. And then receive and transmit the chemical messages to the, the other cells of the system and then aid in cellular development. So making new cells, making memory and all those other things. And again, you have a unique MHC marker, which tells it it's you. You have antigens, which are the foreign marker and your body will react to the foreign things, but make sure that your normal, yourself doesn't get attacked. And so that's how a normal functioning immune system works. Obviously there can be issues where your immune system doesn't work properly and your unique marker now gets attacked by your immune system. And that's called uh, auto antigens or auto responses or autoimmunities. And again, we'll look at this more in chapter 16. We'll talk a little bit about it today but your body can respond to those things. And when that happens, that's when you get autoimmunities. And we'll look at some of those things again in chapter 16. All right, so what is your self marker? We have two markers on our cells that really are responsible for determining what is self and what is foreign. The first one is called the MHC. And the MHC are found in all cells except red blood cells. And one of the reasons why we can easily donate red blood cells is it doesn't have an MHC marker that we have to match. So if you think about tissue transplants and you hear about matching or typing, this is what we're talking about. These receptors that they have that we have to match and type so that we can make sure that it's self and not foreign. Okay, so that's what it is. You may have heard of this MHC, also known as the human leukocyte antigen or HLA. So some of you guys that have worked in hospitals before and maybe in the tissue transplant areas, may have heard it referred to as HLA, but it's the same thing. MHC and HLA are interchanged. And again, what it does is it plays recognition in, the, in itself, okay? So they're really there to respond to say, this is me, don't attack me, and then also to help in responses. And so we'll look at that. You actually have two types of MHC, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. But the first one, MHC class one, is found on all cells. This is your marker. This tells your immune system that this is you and no one else. Okay, so that's important. The second one, class two MHC, is one that is used in responses. And so this is found on the B cells and the macrophages and it's used for presentation saying, look what I ate, do something about it. And so it's used to present to the T cells. And we'll talk a little bit more about this here in just a second. But those are the two types. You have the class one, which are found on all cells. And this tells you that you are you, these are the self markers, and then the class two are used to present things. Okay, and so we'll talk about that again here in just a second. Okay, so again, the MHC or HLA, the class one, are unique markers that tell your cells that you are you. Okay, these markers are found on all cells except your red blood cells. So all your cells of your body, all your skin cells, your heart cells, your brain cells, your liver cells, all those cells have a marker on them that say, this is me, do not attack, okay? And that's your MHC class one. The MHC class two are markers that are found on antigen presenting cells. So these are cells that present to the T cells. So we say macrophages, sometimes B cells, uh, dendritic cells, any cells that are gonna present antigen to the T cells are known as MHC class two. So these are kind of, think of like two hands holding something to the T cell saying, aha, here, I have something, okay? So when you think of, aha, I have something, that's the MHC class two. And these are only found on specific presenting cells. The class one, 
on all cells except your blood cells. And again, these are to tell you you are you and nobody else. Okay, so class one is you are you. Class two is used for presentation. Hopefully that makes a lot of sense. And again, that's one of those things I like to ask questions about. So make sure you remember that for the test. Okay, we also have, like I said, the two types of of cells. We have the B cells and the T cells. And the best way to remember this is think of B cells are for the outside invaders, so invaders that are found outside the body or outside the outside the cells themselves, I shouldn't say outside the body because they're inside the body, but outside the body or outside the cells, okay? So that's where the B cells attack. The T cells are specific for antigens or pathogens that are inside the cells. So think of viruses in this case. So B cells, anything outside the cell, T cells inside the cell, okay? And that's what these do, okay? And so B cell receptors bind free antigens and T cells bind, they help present, and then they're gonna to bind to other cells and attack and kill cells, okay? And that's the helper and the cytotoxic. So B cells produce the antibody. And we'll talk more about this as we go along, but think of it this way. I like this little cartoon. B cells attack the outside of cells, T cells attack inside the cells. If you remember that, you've got it, you've got it made with the B and T cells. Okay, so before we get too far ahead of ourselves and talk specifically about B and T cells, we need to talk about how these guys are actually made. And so this is going into the idea of what's going on in your bone marrow. You remember I talked about last time in chapter 14 about the master stem cell and that it can differentiate into lots of different blood cells. But today what we're gonna look at is specifically that stem cell turning into B and T cells. Okay, and so you actually have in your B and T cells 500 different genes that produce a tremendous variety of receptors. And remember, each one of your B cells and each one of your T cells recognizes a different specific antigen. And so that means you have millions of cells that recognize a million different receptors, okay? So again, undifferentiated lymphocytes undergo a continuous series of divisions and genetic changes that cause you to have millions of unique cells, okay? So this is the idea of clonal selection theory. And so again, you have that one stem cell, those one stem cells go into different cells. And what you do is you make lots and lots of cells in the bone marrow. And once they become mature, they gain the receptors. And again, that's through gene rearrangement and all that. So think of this as you have one cell, that one cell can produce more cells and that makes each different type of variety. What I like to think of is think of ice cream. Ice cream is an easy way because we all like different types. Let's say you go to the frozen yogurt. So where I live, we have what is uh, the orange leaf. And orange leaf is a frozen yogurt place. And you go in there and they have about 30 different varieties of frozen yogurt. Well, one day you might like strawberry. Another day you might like chocolate. Another day you might like ice cream or the, the birthday cake or whatever it is. Okay, So think of it this way. Each one of these cells is a different flavor of ice cream. And again, these will respond only to that flavor that when you con come in contact, that cell will come in contact with it. Okay, so think of it that way. Each one of these cells is a different flavor of ice cream. So you see the colors and that stuff. Each one will only respond to that flavor. Okay. In the bone marrow, you have this development and the T cells. So the bone marrow develops these cells, the B cells and the T cells. The B cells gain the receptor in the bone marrow, and once they've gained that receptor, they respond only to that one flavor ice cream. They then go and sit in any of the lymph nodes that you have around your body. So they're free to go and migrate to whatever lymph node they want to go to. So it could be the, the lymph nodes of your um, throat and of your neck, could be in the lymph nodes in your armpit, could be in the lymph nodes in your groin, could be in the lymph nodes anywhere in your body, could be the spleen, okay? The T cells, what they do is they get produced in the bone marrow, then they leave the bone marrow and go to the thymus. The thymus is where they gain the receptor, and again, each receptor is for a different specific antigen. Once they gain the receptor, they leave the thymus and they go to any bone or to any lymph node out there. Again, could be in your neck, could be in your armpit, groin, wherever in your body and then again now they're just waiting to come in contact with the right antigen and that's the idea so you develop all these different flavors of B and T cells all these different flavors are just ready for when that flavor comes in that antigen comes in ready for the attack so you should have now millions and millions of different B and T cells all just waiting waiting for the right antigen to come to bind to so it's kind of this waiting game okay 
Once you have this waiting game, we have this lymphocyte development. Sometimes you actually make receptors that will bind to self. And, and during this process, these receptors are tested. And if they bind to self, they're eliminated right away. And so this is the idea here. So you make clones. And so you have the stem cell. The stem cell makes all these different varieties of B cells or T cells. Okay, so you can say this one's vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, birthday cake, whatever else. But let's say you make a couple that recognize yourself. Obviously, you don't want those cells out there because they're going to be binding to you and attacking you. So you eliminate those right away. And so those cells get eliminated and only the ones that are for non-self antigens progress on. Now, it's believed in some people, now we don't know why this is, that sometimes these cells actually get through. So the ones that still recognize self and maybe it's kind of like a slight mismatch, it's not perfect match, but a real close, that somehow these cells get through and they end up in circulation, which then leads to development of autoantibodies. So someone might say, hey, I've got an autoantibody like lupus, or I have an autoimmunity like Crohn's disease or rheumatoid arthritis or something like that. And it's believed that maybe some of these cells actually snuck through when they were developed early on in the early stages and then became activated over a long period of time. Others think there's a different thing that goes on and there might be other triggering mechanisms, but the idea is that early on in development, so this is during your lifetime and during, during when you make all these cells, that they're supposed to be eliminated so that they don't recognize self. And that's the idea. So for right now, let's not worry about autoimmunities and things like this. Let's just say the eliminated clones get eliminated early on because they recognize self and that now you have all these unique ones. So this guy recognizes vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, birthday cake, orange, grape, okay? All these different flavors. And so now they all recognize a different flavor. And when that flavor comes into you, it's going to respond to it. And it can only respond to that flavor, okay? All right. So when that happens, so now these guys are activated. They're sitting there waiting for the right flavor to come in. Let's say number two is chocolate, and now you got exposed to the chocolate antigen. That chocolate antigen comes in, it binds with the cell, it says, I see chocolate, and voila, what happens is now you start this process. This activation takes place. The B cells now get activated for this chocolate, and so now it says, aha, this pathogen is here, I need to do something about it. So what it will do is two different things. One, it will start mass producing cells. And you can see here that this number two starts to expand. And this is what we call clonal expansion. And so this is why you start to feel swelling in your lymph nodes when you get sick. Because what happens is, is those B cells are recognizing that antigen that you're exposed to when you're sick and it starts to grow. And so what you start to feel is the swelling and that's the number of B cells expanding in your lymph nodes. Okay, And so that's why you feel the swelling, the B cells or the T cells. Are responding to the antigen. Once they respond, you start to make thousands of B cells, and these B cells either become memory, which lasts for a long time, again, you can have these for many, many years, or you start making these plasma cells, which start producing antibody, and these antibodies then get released in the bloodstream to gobble up all the other chocolate antigen that you have out there, and that's the idea, okay? So what you have is this clonal expansion. So think of it this way. You have a million cells out there waiting to respond. When that one specific antigen comes in and it finds that specific B cell, that B cell gets activated, gets turned on, and it starts making thousands and thousands of cells. Those thousands and thousands of cells are now ready to attack. Some make new, fresh antibody. Others go and remember what they saw so that you have more cells to respond the next time you come to it. And that's going to be an important thing. So memory is an important thing and one of the reasons why we get vaccinated. Okay, so think of it that way. you got all these cells waiting to go, and until you come into the specific antigen, that's when it's going to attack. Okay, that's the idea. Now, this is a really good video. I highly recommend watching this. I don't put it on here just because it's a little long on the video, and I don't want to make this video even longer. But I highly recommend watching this one, and you can stop this right here and watch this video, and I think this explains it even better with a lot better pictures and everything else. It shows what happens when you get strep throat and how your body responds, and I think it's a really good video. So take a look at this and watch it, and it will really explain the whole idea of having one cell specifically recognizing a specific antigen and then start mass producing that cell in your lymph nodes, 
and then those reproduce, start making antibodies that attack and, and fight off the infection, okay? It's a great video to watch, so take a look at that, and I think you'll be really happy you did. All right, so here's your first concept check of the day. So all lymphocytes have the same receptor specificity. Is that true or false? Hopefully, if you listen to me long enough, you would say that's false because each one of your B cells and your T cells have different specificity. So again, each one is a different flavor. So if you think of different flavors for each one, remember you have millions of cells, they all have different specificity for different antigens, okay? So hopefully you said false on that one. If you said false, you got it right. All right, so let's take a few minutes and look at the B cells specifically. And again, the B cells are going after outside things, outside the cells. So if you think outside the cells, those are the B cells. Those are where your specific specificity and memory take place outside of cells. So we'll look at B cells and then we'll turn around and then look at the T cells after that. All right, so the B cell receptor is called an antibody and an antibody is shaped like a Y, okay? And so it has four polypeptide chains. And again, you have two heavy chains that are linked together and you have two short chains, which are our light chains, they call them, that are also linked together. And you can see that it's labeled with these two different things. You have the V region and the C region. The C region is the constant region. This is never, that never changes. This region never changes in its protein structure and is always the same on any antibody. This is the spot that binds to the cells, okay? So this constant region always binds to the cells. This variable region is what changes, and this is what gives it its specificity. So again, think about the locks. Each one of our locks are different on all our different houses and our cars, okay? The key for your car is not gonna work on your house key, and that's because you have a different lock. Same thing here. These are like the locks on your cells, okay? These locks are all different and it's looking for the specific key. That could be a key from a virus, that could be a key from a bacteria, could be a key from a protozoa. Whatever it is, that key is gonna be what binds to that lock. And again, each one of those are different. So that's the variable region. And each one of these receptors are gonna have a different variable region. The constant region stays the same. Okay, and again, this is how antigens bind to antibodies. It is a good fit system. And so you need to have a nice tight fit, the lock and key. So here again is the key, fits into the lock, and then you get a response. You can see this one doesn't have a fit. And this one here, even though it fits into the lock, it's a very poor fit. So you might get a little response to it, but it's not good enough to cause an immune response that would be vigorous and fight the infection. And so you need a specific lock and key mechanism that fits perfectly to get the right response. So think of lock and key with these antigen antibody responses. Okay, once you get this maturation, the maturation means it gains a receptor. That's all it means is that the B cells gain the receptor. And again, each receptor is different for each B cell and each receptor recognizes a different specific antigen. Okay, once that happens in the bone marrow, these guys leave the bone marrow and then they go and home to specific sites, either lymph nodes, spleen, the galt, wherever in the body, and they find a spot to hang out. So basically they're just gonna go and hang out and say, okay, I'm ready and waiting for the next wonderful antigen that I only respond to, to come in contact with. Once it does, it becomes activated. So again, can come in contact with antigens throughout its life. And again, it has to find the perfect fit in order for this thing to work. It's looking for the specific key for that lock to bind to, okay? Once it binds to, that's when we become activated and you're ready to take off and make a response. But until then, you could have many things bind to it and not find the right key and lock. And until it does, it will not respond, okay? And that's the, key, that's the idea. You have to get the right key with the right lock for response to take place, okay? What causes that response to take place? This is called an antigen. And an antigen is just simply any foreign substance that provokes an immune response in specific lymphocytes. So it's any part of that protein or any part of a pathogen that will bind to that antibody that will cause a response, okay? And again, property of behaving as an antigen is called an antigenicity. And so this is basically causing a response. So anything that can cause a response will cause a activation of your B and T cells. So we'll talk about this. What is What are some properties? Foreignness, so anything that's not supposed to be there can cause a response. 
size can be another thing shape and accessibility obviously and how it can bind so it's all about the lock and key fitting into that antibody and that's important again what can cause or what can be an antigen any microbial cell or virus human uh, foreign human or animal cells that are added in can cause a response and even plant molecules or other things that can cause a response so like things like pollen things like food that we eat Things like uh, dust that we breathe in can all cause responses. Spores in the air, and these things all trigger different responses in our body. And we'll look at this again specifically in Chapter 16. But for now, just think of an antigen as any part of a pathogen or a molecule that's foreign that your body can recognize and cause a response. Okay? All right, and what are some characteristics? Again, it's perceived as foreign and not a normal constituent of the body. Anything that's large and over 10,000 molecular weight are the most antigenic. And again, what it's looking for is a specific spot. So on a specific antigen, you can actually have multiple spots. And so you can see here, and we call that an epitope. And so if you look at this, here's a protein, okay? The antibody can actually bind to any of these parts. So you can see all these different spots are epitopes. And this is where a specific antibody could bind to, okay? And it doesn't have to be just here, but it could be at any of these spots. As long as it sees it and recognizes it, it can bind to it. And again, an antigen has many antigenic or epitopes in its, in its thing. And so that makes it more antigenic. The more epitopes you have, the more antigenic you are because you can bind more antibodies to it. So again, think of this. Pathogen has many, many different antigens to it. And again, it, it has specificity for each one of your B cells. And so each one of those Things on a pathogen can respond to all these different things. So that's what I want you to think about. Okay, so let's clear it up. Pathogen has thousands of different antigens a lot of times on it. And each one of those antigens can bind to a specific B or T cell. Okay, if that makes sense to you. So think of this, like an E. coli. E. coli has lots of different things on the outside of it. Each one of those things that are on the outside of it are an antigen because it's foreign, it isn't recognized by the body, or it's recognized that the body is foreign, and it can respond to one of many of the different types of B and T cells that you have. And so that's why the body will respond to it, cause an immune response, and have, have you fight this infection. Okay, and that's how that all works. So hopefully I didn't confuse you too much there, but so we think of it as an antigen. Okay. So let's take a look at this, and I think this video will kind of clear this up a little bit more for you. So let's take a look. Antigens are macromolecules, usually of molecular weight greater than 10,000, such as proteins and polysaccharides. They are recognized by the immune system as foreign. Individual antibodies are not made against the entire antigen molecule but rather to particular chemical groups on the molecules known as antigenic determinants or epitopes. Many different antibodies can be made against a single antigen, each antibody reacting with a different epitope. Complex structures such as the surfaces of bacterial cells may have many different epitopes. Each different antibody binds only to the correct epitope. What I really like about this video is it shows you, again, specifically, let's say this is an E. coli cell. You can see on this E. coli cell, it has lots of different antigens on there. Again, the E. coli cell itself is foreign, but it has lots of different macromolecules on it that are also foreign, okay? And each one of those different things has a epitope on it, and that will bind to a specific B cell receptor. Each B cell receptor has a specific key that it will bind to. And think of these as all different types of keys, and those keys will bind to those receptors. When those receptors see it, it will recognize it and say, you're not supposed to be here, and then eliminate it. So that's the idea. So think of it that. I think this is a great video just to kind of show you the difference between an antigen and an epitope. And again, lots of antigens on the outside of one cell that all can be recognized by different antibodies that are in your system. Okay, now haptins are really small foreign molecules. These are things that are smaller than the 10,000 molecular weight. And a lot of times, if they're not attached to anything, they will not cause a response. Even though they're foreign, they're too small to be recognized by the, by the body or by the receptor. 
So a lot of times what happens is we have to attach it to a carrier molecule to actually make it respond. So you can kind of see here in this little demonstration, this little haptin does not cause a response. So if we inject it in a mouse, there's no response, no binding, no, no response to it. If we attach a much longer molecule, which we call a carrier molecule to it, you inject it into the mouse, now the mouse will make a response to it, it can recognize it, and then aha, you make an antibody response, and now you can make an immune response to it. So that's just showing you what happens a lot of times when we have too small of a molecule that if we want to make an antigenic response. Now, why would we want to even make an antigenic response? So think of things like vaccines. Vaccines are ways for your body to respond to things, even though not giving you the whole pathogen. And we'll talk about that when we get into vaccines. But this is one of those ideas. So when you have a small piece of something and you want to make a response to it and it's too small to make a normal response, you can add things to it to make sure that you make that response. Okay, and that's called haptins. All right, now we do have some special categories of antigens, and I've talked a little about this already. Now, there are some things called alloantigens, and these are cell surface markers and molecules that are on some members of the same species, but not on others. And so this is what happens when we give someone a transplant, okay? We have what are called alloantigens. If we give someone that has, even though they're human and human cells, they have different markers than what we do. And your body will recognize that and will attack because it'll say, yeah, I know this is human, but it's not my human and I'm attacking it. And so this is why we have to match people up with tissue typing, because if you don't match, you're going to attack. And so we need to make sure that these things match perfectly so you don't get that attack. And that's the alloantigen when people attack other human cells. OK, now there's another thing called superantigens, and superantigens uh, provide a potent T cell stimulator. And we're going to talk about this more uh, later on in this lecture. But what these things do is respond and cause an overwhelming response. So this is when you have a nonspecific response of your T cells. The perfect example of this is something that's found on Staph aureus. Staph aureus releases a toxin that causes T cells to respond. Now, you women out there may have seen this before. This is called toxic shock. And so this toxic shock, this is the warning that you see on, on tampons. If you wear them too long, what happens is the bacteria builds up and releases this uh, toxin. This toxin will cause your T cells to respond. You get this overwhelming response, which will cause your body to go in shock and you can die from it. And so, again, we'll talk more about this in a little while with the T cells. But these types of antigens that cause an overwhelming T cell response are called super antigens because they are super tough and they cause a super response. OK, another one that many of us are familiar with are called allergens. Allergens are antigens that cause our mast cells or our, um, our mast cells to respond, the IgE. And again, we're going to look at this in Chapter 16. These are the ones that cause allergies and cause the allergenic response. Most of the time, it's one of these things that causes the localized response, whether it's hives on the skin, the, the itchy eyes, the runny nose, the watery eyes. Those are local responses. Sometimes you can have an overwhelming response, which is called the anaphylactic response. And that basically shuts down your whole respiratory system. That's a bad thing. And so some of you guys may be, may be aware of your overwhelming response and you carry around what is called an EpiPen. And again, that epinephrine is injected to Make sure that you can keep yourself alive so you can get to the hospital so you don't die from the overwhelming response. And again, we'll look at that in chapter 16. The last one is the autoantigens. And again, this is something which should be eliminated out of your body. However, sometimes we get this response. And again, what the happens is, is that these things are like self-markers or they are self-markers. And these guys, these T and B cells respond to them and they start attacking yourself. And this is a bad situation. And so we see this in different types of diseases like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, sometimes in Crohn's disease or IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome. Another one is the um, skin infections and things like this that you have. And so we'll look at these different types of things. And these are autoantigens where your body's responding. Another one's MS where it attacks the nerve cells. And then, and again, we'll talk more about this in chapter 16, but again, we're seeing lots of these different things. And I think some of it has to do to how bored our immune systems are getting in that. And so again, we'll look at that all in chapter 16, but I just want you to be aware of some of these different types of antigens that are out there. Most of the time, antigens are a foreign material on pathogens and things we don't want in our body, but obviously you can have different categories that can cause serious problems 
due to the same type of response that you get with just normal antigens as well. Okay, so which of the following would be the least likely to produce a large immune response? Would it be a complex antigen with multiple antitopes? Would it be a simple antigen bound to inhabitant? Would it be an antigen exhibiting repeated structure or an allergen? So which one do you think would not cause a huge response? If you were thinking a simple antigen bound to a haptin, you're probably right because this one will only have a specific response. And again, when you're talking about haptins, haptins are really small structures that typically don't cause a response. And so it's really hard to get these things to respond because they are so small. So a lot of times you don't see much of a response at all with a simple antigen and a haptin in, included in that. Okay, so if you said that, you're listening and you're catching on to how these things respond. All right, so once the antigen and antibody response to the lock and key find each other, you get this overwhelming B cell response. And again, what happens is the B cells start dividing and you start to feel the swelling in your neck or wherever you have the lymph nodes that are responding. Sometimes you get a vaccine in your arm. You might feel it in your armpit sometimes, like if you get the flu shot the next day, your arm's real sore. You might even feel it in your armpit. That's because you have lymph nodes and the B and T cells are responding to that antigen. They're binding to that antigen and creating a response. So what you're doing is you're producing B cells. These B cells are then making memory for long-term uh, storage, think of that, long-term memory. And then the other cells are plasma cells, which start producing gobs and gobs of antibody. And these antibodies are ready for the attack. So they know you have this pathogen, it's going in and trying to find this pathogen and waiting for that attack. And that's what happens during B cell activation, okay? Think of multiple cells responding, big cells going off, making more and more cells, making plasma cells and memory cells at the same time, okay? Here shows you the picture. So again, you have the microbe, the B cell responds to the specific microbe. You get response to it. You get sometimes presentation with the helper cells. These activated B cells then go and make memory cells, which will remember for a long period of time. They maintain that specificity in the circulation. And then you get these, basically these little antibody factories, these plasma cells. These plasma cells, all they do is churn out lots and lots of antibody. So if you actually look at some of these plasma cells, they're loaded with ribosomes and they're loaded with rough ER because all they're gonna do in their little lifetime is make lots and lots of antibody. Those antibodies get made and those things then go on the attack. So you can see here, antibodies go after the micro and voila, you fight the infection. And that's how that stuff goes, okay? So that's activation. Come in contact with it, you get contact, you get response, response makes memory cells, and then also makes antibody or antibody cells, which is known as plasma cells, okay? All right, so what do these antibodies do? So once you have all these antibodies, they can do a number of different things, okay? So once you start producing these things, these antibodies land on the microbes that they're supposed to affect. The first one is called opsonization, and that's essentially basically saying, this is a microbe, kill it. And so what the antibody does is it kind of lands on the microbe and lands all over it and says, white blood cell, you attack. And so what it does is it kind of flags it and says, okay, neutrophil, this is what you can eat. And so that tells it to eat it. Okay. And that's opsonization. You can see here, here's the macrophage seeing these guys flagged with the antibody and says, okay, this means I must eat it. And so that's what it does. It eats it and presents it. And then the system goes on. Second thing that antibodies can do is actually neutralize things. So one of the things that it can do is neutralize viruses. So when you have a virus in your cell, a lot of times what can happen is once you your body responds to that virus, produces antibodies, which will actually block the spikes from actually atta attaching to cells. And again, the same thing can happen. You can neutralize a virus from binding. You can also then flag it for the macrophage to eat it. So, But neutralization blocks the thing. The other place that the antibodies will do this is with toxins. And so you may have heard of people becoming immune to a toxin in their lifetime. So they get repeated snake bites or whatever. And then they say, I'm completely immune to that. And it, it is true because what happens if you get repeated exposure to something, your body is going to make a response. It's going to make an antibody response that the next time you come and exposed to it, it will block the toxin. So they're not wrong about that. Now, I don't recommend you going out and getting bit by rattlesnakes the next time and saying, I'm gonna make immunity to it. Okay, the idea is though, repeated exposure to something is gonna make an immune response that your body will recognize the next time you come in contact with it. 
okay? Not saying that this is a perfect situation, but it will eventually do that. So someone that does this in the field and, and repeatedly gets exposed to something will make these neutralizing antibodies. This is essentially what we get when we get a tetanus shot. We get a shot of antibodies that help protect us from the toxin that these things make. Now, if you get exposed to it, one of the shots you get is a neutralization antibody, which will actually block the toxin, so it will prevent you from getting uh, lockjaw. Okay, but when you go in for a normal tetanus shot, typically what it is is the bacterial toxin or toxoid toxin, which is basically helping you produce antibodies so that if you come in contact with tetanus, you don't get the you don't get the thing and you basically neutralize the toxin. Again, this only lasts for about 10 years, and so that's why you have to get repeated boosters on these things. But that's the idea behind that type of vaccine, okay, is that neutralization. Okay, another thing that the antibody can do is agglutination. This is where it actually causes a, uh, basically a globbing up of antigens. And so this is what we'll see a lot of times with blood. Okay, and so we'll talk about antigens and antibodies. And so in chapter 16, we're going to talk about the ABO response. This is what happens when you get the wrong blood type. What your body will do is you produce antibodies to different blood types. So let's say you're an A blood type. You, if you get exposed to B blood, so let's say the doctor makes a mistake and gives you B blood and instead of your normal A type blood, what your antibodies in your blood right now will do is it recognizes the B cell, those B type blood cells, and says you're not supposed to be here and it'll actually bind to it and cause it to clog up. And so this will cause clots to form. This is not a good situation. It'll lice the blood and all these other things happening and you don't want that. But this is how we can tell what type of blood that you have. So what we'll do is take a little bit of your blood, add the different antibodies to it, and see which one causes clumping and which one doesn't. And we can tell what type of blood you have by which one clumps and which one doesn't. And so it's kind of a neat way. So that's called agglutination. And again, we use this a lot of times for testing and other things. A lot of, a lot of times you don't want it clumping inside your body, but it will happen outside as a test. And we'll, we'll see that. Okay, we also have complement fixation, which again, what happens is the flagging of these things will cause complement to recognize it and say, let's kill it. And so this is the non-white cell way of attacking where these proteins will bind on with the antibodies and look at that. And we looked at this back in chapter 14 with complement. And then the last one is precipitation. This is how pregnancy tests works. And so basically what it has are these antibodies on the little filter paper. You pee on the stick and if you have that hormone, it binds the antibody and then causes a color change to occur. And so if you are pregnant, you get the little plus symbol. If you're not pregnant, you don't have the hormone, it doesn't bind, and you get the negative symbol. And so that's how that works, is through precipitation of an antigen antibody. And so again, we'll look at these situations in, in chapter 16 as well, okay? Just to give you a little idea of how these things work. Okay. So we also need to know that we have five types of B-cell receptors or antibodies, okay? So there's the five types. We have the IgG, the IgA, the IgM, the ID, IgD, and the IgE. The IgG is the primary antibody that we have in our system. And so most of the antibody responses that we make is in the IgG reform. This is shown as the Y, and I'll show you a picture of this here in just a second. So IgG is the one that's normally made by most of your B-cells after response to an antigen, okay? IgA is antibodies that we find associated with the mucous membranes. And so we also call this the secretory antibody because we see it with the mucous membranes. We also see it in the uh, as an antibody that moms pass on to their, uh, their babies through breast milk. So if you breastfeed your babies, what you're doing is also providing them some antibodies for protection. So anything mom has been exposed to that makes an IgA antibody the little baby gets in the meantime while drinking mom's breast milk. And so that's one of the benefits of drinking breast milk in that case. The IgM is one of the first antibodies we make, and then it switches over to the IgG. And again, I'll show you this, but this is kind of like the primary antibody, and then you get the secondary response, and I'll show you that. The IgD is one that we find as a receptor on the B cells, and then the IgE is the one that we see in response to on mast cells. So we'll see this guy again, the Ig, when we talk about allergies. This is the allergy response antibody. And again, we'll look at this in the next chapter. Okay, here's a picture of what these antibodies look like. And again, they each have, again, they all have the Y shape. The difference is, is how they form either dimers or monomers or 
or sometimes you get pentamers. And so the IgE, IgG is the simple Y. This is the one that's floating around in your blood. Okay, the IgA, like I said, is found a lot of times in secretions. It's typically found as a dimer, but sometimes you also see it as a monomer. It's a little bit shorter than the IgG a lot of times. But again, this is what we talk about the secretory antibody. So this is in the breast milk and in the mucous membranes and other things that we secrete out of our bodies. Okay. IgM is a pentamer. So it's a very large antibody that can trap lots of antigens at the same time. This is the first an antibody that's produced by your B cells when you come in contact with a response. So this is the first. This is the second. We'll talk about that in just a minute. The IgD is what is found on the B cells, so this is directly attached to the B cells themselves. And then the IgE is responsible for your allergies. And again, we'll talk about this in the next chapter. So when we see this, so mast cells. So think of mast cells, IgE, and we'll talk about that in chapter 16. Okay, so what happens when you get a response? Okay, so let's say this is the first time you've come in contact. So let's say you are sitting in class now and your neighbor next to you sneezes and in the same time what happens is you're breathing in some of those little viral particles that they sneeze and they land on your throat okay those things enter into your cells and cause you to get sick okay so let's say you get sick and what happens in your response okay so what happens in that antigen response is that you get exposed to that antigen so that's when the virus comes in and lands on your cells okay gets into your cells and starts making new viruses. Well, your B cells recognize it, okay? The antigen is exposed, and it takes about 10 to 12 days for your whole system to ramp up and kick up. So it isn't like this instant on type of thing. It takes time because remember, that one specific receptor has to find that antigen. And so it has to go to the right antigen to, or the right antigen has to find the right antibody to bind to, and that's the key. So it's got to find it, and that could be anywhere in the body. So that takes time, okay? It's not just an instant on and off. So we have a lag period that takes place. Once it does find the right B cell, that B cell responds, and it starts producing an IgM. That IgM gets secreted out into your bloodstream, and it starts finding that antigen and binding to it. The second time and that's again in about the first five days after the lag period then you start producing IgG so there's a switch over in your B cells and again it's a little bit more complicated than the switching on and off but what happens is you get a much more vigorous response and you get an IgG response that kind of takes care of the rest of it so you go into this mode where you start making IgM then it flips over to IgG and voila about 30 days later you're clear of the infection you feel better and everything's done but again, what happens in the primary response is you have this lag period. And so this is the time where you get sick. So again, it's not this instant response. You get sick. Your body clears the infection with the antibodies. And again, it's a long-term type of thing. This is a good response because what you do also in this time is not only do you produce antibodies at this time with your plasma cells, but you make memory. And that's going to be the key. You're making, making that memory. So now the next time you come in contact with it, you're ready to respond, okay? So let's say you went through the response, you got sick, you recovered, you feel better now, you feel like a million damn dollars now and you're ready to go on, okay? So let's say the next time, another neighbor who just got sick sneezes again and you breathe that in, you're like, oh no, I'm gonna get sick again. Well, your body is now ready for the attack. Let's say it was that same infection, that same molecule that you got in contact with before, you now have those memory cells that are ready to respond. And there are more memory cells than just that one that was there before. So now you get this very quick response. So again, you don't see that lag period. So this is now your second exposure. Within the first three days, you have that binding occur. Your B cells go on overdrive. And those B cells start making lots of IgM and a ton of IgG. And this response is so overwhelming that you don't even get sick. And so you say, yes, I've avoided it. But really what's going on under the scenes is you're making tons and tons of antibody. And the reason why you don't get sick that second time is that you have this very large immune response. And we call this the amniastic response. This amniastic response is this overwhelming response of antibody to that antigen that you see the second time. Okay. Why do we get vaccinated for things? It's so we can jump right to the secondary response. That's the important key. Okay, 
We don't want to get that primary response. We don't want to get sick. So if we get a vaccine, the vaccine takes us through that primary response to build that memory so that when we come in contact with the real antigen, we're ready to go. And so that's why we get vaccinated for things. It's not just to get a shot in the arm and say, wow, I feel miserable for a day because my arm's sore. The reason why is we're setting our bodies up so that we have the secondary response, we're ready for the attack, and we're ready to go. And if you can do that, everything's ready to go, and you're healthy, and you may remain healthy throughout your lifetime if you get your vaccine. So that's why vaccines are important, to set you up for that secondary response. So if you ever have a friend that says, oh, vaccines are worthless, they don't do anything for you, you can just bring up this slide and say, here, let me tell you about why you should get vaccinated for things. It's make, make sure that you don't get sick. You have the secondary response, you don't get sick, you get this overwhelming response, your immune system's ready for the attack, and you don't get sick. Okay, that's why you get vaccinated. This is a good question. Okay, we can also make monoclonal antibodies. And so you have probably have heard of these things where we have antibodies to detect things. We have antibodies that we can give people to treat different diseases and that stuff. And again, what this means is that you have a purified population of antibodies that now you have on the shelf that you can give to someone if they get sick. This is how we make antitoxins or antivenoms, is you make these monoclonal antibodies to go exactly against those things. And so we think of antivenoms or antitoxins, this is what we're thinking of, these monoclonal antibodies, okay? And so essentially what it does is we uh, inject animals with the antigen, we produce these cells, these plasma cells, we mix them in with these cell lines that are basically regenerative that they make more and more over and over and so what we do is we force the cells to make these plasma cells over and over again and this allows us to make antibodies these antibodies produce tons and tons of antibodies and we can then make lots and lots of product it's a very complex system and i'm not doing it justice so again don't run off and try and make your own monoclonal lab based on this but the idea is that you can inject an animal make antibodies and incorporate these into a B cell that's malignant or a cancerous cell to kind of let it go on and on and on. And then you become a little antibody factory in a dish to make tons and tons of antibody now that you can sell as either a drug or a detection system or something else. And we have lots of examples of these different things. Okay, so what are some examples? So here are some of the names of these monoclonal antibodies. And so you can see here are the names of some of these drugs. And maybe some of you have heard of them because you may have yourself or a family member or someone else that you may have been treating on these types of drugs. And again, these things are for therapies. And what they do is they target these cells specifically. Remember, it's a specific antibody which will target these diseases and go after them. And so again, what we're finding is that especially when we're treating cancer, specificity is a key. We want to kill the cancer cells, not the rest of the cells that you have in your body. And so some of these things are really good and just getting cancer out of you and not killing the rest of your cells. And so that's what we're looking at, okay? So that's the idea. All right, so let's talk about T cells for a minute. I talked a little bit about B cells. The important thing about B cells is the antibody. Now let's talk about T cells, and T cells are now gonna go after things inside the cells itself, okay? So T cells think inside the cells themselves. All right, and again, with the T cells, we have a receptor. And again, it's very similar to what we see in an antibody but again now in this case it's only two proteins here that are bonded together and again you have a constant region that's bound to the cells and a variable region which responds to the antigen okay so a variable region responds to the antigen the constant region which is bound to cells now one difference between the t-cell receptor and the antibody is is the t-cell receptor is never secreted into the blood in the blood, if you took your blood right now and you purified it out, you would find antibodies that your B cells have secreted, not attached to B cells, okay? You just have free-floating antibodies that are already present in your body. In T cells, T cells never secrete their receptor. It's always attached to T cells. And the reason for this is it's not necessarily made for uh, binding to the antigens outside the cell. What they're made for is actually responding and binding to either antigens that are being presented to them or responding to cells that are infected and saying, hey, do something about it. So we'll talk about that. But T cell receptors are never secreted. So that's the di main difference between T cells and B cells. They never secrete anything, okay? Or at least the receptors out. All right, same thing happens with the T cells. T cells are made in the bone marrow, but instead of gaining the receptor in the bone marrow, what they do is they leave the bone marrow and go to the thymus. 
it's directed by directed through hormones and other chemical attraction to get to the thymus and then you get these T cells and so you get this CD marker and so you get these different classes you have two types well actually you have three but we're only going to talk about two you have the CD4 and the CD8 the CD4 are going to be your T helper cells and the CD8 are going to be your C cytotoxic cells and we'll talk about this again in a minute the CD4 are the helper CD8 are the cytotoxic, and so the helper are going to be help present, the CD8 are going to help kill, okay? So that's what we're going to think about. Once they gain the receptors, they are now ready to go out into their lymphoid organs and sit and wait just like the B cells do, waiting for the right time to attack, okay? Once they get their specific uh, direct involvement of the T cells, they get the antigen. The antigen are presented to them. So again, they don't bind just free floating antigen. They have to be presented to. So they're a little bit more specific in what they want. They have to be presented to by the macrophages or the B cells. The B cells and the macro macrophages will say, look what we have. You need to do something about a T cell. And it says, okay, I see it. Let's do something. And so what happens is then the T cells then go and respond. They become activated. They secrete other chemicals called cytokines to turn on the rest of the system. And then once the system gets going, you'll start to see the T cells respond and those will kill cells that are infected with viruses or internal uh, pathogens inside cells. And we'll see this in a little bit. Okay, so that's how the process works. So again, I talked about how you have these different types of helper cells. So think of CD4 as the helper cell, CD8 as its cytotoxic. And again, you have two different types of uh, helper cells. The CD4 helper, the helper cell ones work with the MHC2 and again, releases a number of different cytokines. And then this helper cell two uh, responds and does a different more with the B cells. And again, we'll look at, we're not gonna really focus in on the different types of helper cells in this case. I just want you to know that there are some types that are helper cells and some that are going to kill cells okay so helper cells and killer cells think of that all right so what happens in the activation so again the t cell has to be presented it just can't bind an antigen on its own so it actually has to be shown the antigen first and that's where that mhc class 2 you remember we talked about the class 2 the little hand saying here you go that's what happens here these little hands the mhc class 2 presents it to a t cell and the T cell says, ooh, we need to do something about that. And so once it gets presented to, it then can go and respond. And so what happens here is the helper cell helps. And so what it does is it will go and get presented to by the macrophage or the B cell, becomes activated, and then it starts secreting the system. So once it gets activated, it will link it to the B cell, turn the B cells on, and it'll also activate the T cells as well. So you get two different systems getting turned on. So this is the T helper activation where it gets presented to by the macrophages. So it helps the system along. So it kind of helps in between the presentation of the antigen or the antigen to the B cells. Okay, so that's the T helper cell. Now, the other thing that can happen is so again, you have that MHC class two presenting. Here's the CD4 helper cell. It can make memory cells. It can activate B cells. It can also stimulate macrophages. It can also turn on the CD8 cells and those CD8 cells become activated and make memory cells. And then they go in and say, aha, we see cells that have pathogens in them. We need to kill, kill, kill. And so the helper cell is really necessary to activate the rest of the T cells and also help turn on the rest of the immune system. It's kind of like saying, hey, we could do it on our own. The B cells could do it on our own, but these helper cells really get the fire going and so these helper cells are very important because they get presented to first okay they present it they say i see it let's do something about it one set of cells will go and activate the b cells macrophages and the rest of the immune system the other set of t cells will then go and activate the cytotoxic cells will say all right let's go in let's kill cells let's do it let's destroy and so it's a very important step and so one of the things we think about is with hiv hiv eliminates these helper cells, okay? So if you lose all your CD4 cells, you lose this response mechanism and you lose the CD8 response mechanism. So basically you paralyze one half of your immune system and that's why people die from AIDS is they die from the secondary infections that they get because their immune system doesn't work properly anymore. And so that's the deadly consequence of HIV. Wipes out your immune cells, these CD4s, and now you wipe out all these guys and you wipe out all these guys. And so when you don't have them, 
you can't respond as well and so you get those secondary infections and that's what kills you okay that's what happens with hiv you can see here here's the cytotoxic t cell going in and killing cancer cells so they do a good job of cancer you can also see the cytotoxic t cell killing the cancer cell i think it's very cool so you can see these things go in and they kill cells and so they kill infected cells they kill cells that are dying they kill cells that are cancerous they do a lot of different things and so what we're learning as we do more and more research against cancer is we're finding that if we inflate the immune system the immune system can do our job and kill cancer cells just as well and so we're finding new treatments that don't involve killing cells but actually using our immune system to go in and kill those cells okay and so and that's actually a healthier way because you only eliminate the cells you don't want and not the ones that you do want okay so that's the key there all right so again i talked a little bit about super antigens before if you remember back a couple of slides and we talked about these super antigens what these super antigens are are different proteins or different toxins and things like this these antigens these foreign particles that are indiscriminate they don't just activate one t cell but they activate hundreds of t cells at the same time and what that does is cause an overwhelming response and that overwhelming response is just too much for your body to handle okay what happens in this situation is you provoke an overwhelming immune response it releases cytokines it causes blood vessel damage causes toxic shock where basically your body doesn't know what to do anymore and it just becomes paralyzed and it starts to fall apart and at the same time when that falls apart you get multi-organ damage your organs start to shut down and you die from that that infection okay and so this is something you don't want and this can happen very very quickly and so the example I gave you was with that super absorbent tampons and what we learned was back in the early early to mid 70s when these were first introduced women would keep these in too long and that would cause the staph aureus in the vagina to start secreting these toxins those toxins would be released into the bloodstream it caused this overwhelming response to t-cells and these women who didn't even know they had this staph aureus in them would die from toxic shock within 18 hours of the initial response and so that's a bad thing we don't want that to happen and so that's why there's a warning on the tampon boxes to say do not leave these in more than eight hours and that's to prevent from this overwhelming response to actually occurring okay and I've got a video here to kind of show you what happens with these super antigens and I think it's really good to see so let's take a look at what toxic shock actually does Antigens are normally processed by antigen-presenting cells and presented to T helper cells on class II MHCs. Only the T helper cells with T cell receptors capable of interacting with the antigen are stimulated to produce cytokines. The activated T helper cell stimulates only B cells that react with the same antigen, thereby limiting the response to the production of antibodies that were presented. Super antigens such as the toxic shock syndrome toxin produced by Staphylococcus aureus are not processed by antigen presenting cells. Instead, they bind directly to the outer portion of an MHC class II antigen on antigen presenting cells and to the outer portion of the T cell receptor of T helper cells. Rather than binding to only the cells specific for that antigen, which represent about 1 in 10,000 T cells, the super antigen binds without antigen specificity to as many as 2% to 20% of the T cells. This results in stimulation of many T helper cells. The result is the release and activity of excessive amounts of interleukin-2, IL-2, and other cytokines that enter the bloodstream instead of only acting locally as they normally do. This leads to symptoms of fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and sometimes shock, with failure of many organ systems, circulation failure, and often death. Okay, so the key of this is just the overwhelming response. And so it's not just one T cell that gets activated, but hundreds of T cells get activated at the same time. And that activation releases an overwhelming response that your body doesn't know what to do with. It's an over response of your immune system, and then your body just shuts down in response to that because it just doesn't know what to do. And so it can lead to dire consequences and after this occurs. Okay, so that's super antigens and the idea of toxic shock syndrome. Okay, 
So which lymphocyte is responsible for finding and destroying cancerous cells? Is this the antigen presenting cell, the B cell, the cytotoxic T cell, or the T helper cell? Hopefully answered the cytotoxic T cell because I showed you some examples of that. And again, these cells are really important for the immune system, not, for, not only for cancer cells, but any cells that are infected with an internal pathogen on the inside. So viruses, bacteria, and even some protozoa that actually get inside our cells that can cause damage to our cells. And so these T cells go in, kill those cells that are infected. They're going to die anyways, but if we get the T cells there before they can make new viruses and new let bacteria out, this is what's going to save our lives. So good job if you got it right. All right. So the last thing we're going to talk about today is immunities. And so we're going to look at how we talk about what type of immunity you get. And then again, talking a little bit about vaccines after this. And so when we classify immunities, we actually have four types of immunities. We have active immunity. And active immunity is when you make memory. So think of active immunity as making memory. Okay. So when your body makes memory. So think of that. Passive immunity is when you have an immune response, but you don't make memory to it. And I'll show you an example of how that is. So passive immunity, you have an immune response, but no memory is made. Active immunity is you go through the whole gambit and you make memory to. Natural immunity is when you're naturally exposed to something. So that would be like a sickness. So you get sick from something and you get exposed to it. And artificial would be when you get a vaccine or a shot. So think of artificial, I get a shot in the arm. Okay, so active is you make memory, passive is when you don't make memory, natural is when you get exposed to something in nature, and artificial is when you get a shot. Okay, and so that's the idea of those different things. And you can put those things together and look at them. And again, we'll talk about those as we put these things together uh, throughout types of immunity and vaccines. So let's take a look at what vaccines do. Okay, so again, we have natural immunity and artificial immunity. So this is our acquired immunity. This is our T and B cells. And again, we can either naturally uh, become immune or we can artificially become immune. So this is where we can actually break these things down into a few other categories. So natural immunity, this is when natural things cause a response, okay? So the first one is active immunity and you develop a memory to it. This is when you get sick. Natural active immunity is when you get sick, okay? Natural passive immunity is when you get antibodies from mom. And so the typical one we think of is breastfeeding because you get natural antibodies. Your mom was exposed to things and during her lifetime and she's passing those antibodies on to the baby. Now the baby is not making memory in this case. It's just using those antibodies to provide protection for the short time while she's still breastfeeding. So breastfeeding is good for that first couple of months when the baby doesn't have its own acquired immune system yet going and now it can use those antibodies produced by mom to fight off some infections, okay? Artificial immunity, think of shots. This is what you get through shots, okay? Now, active immunity would be vaccination. This is when you get a shot of something, your body responds to it and makes memory to it. That's that primary secondary response. Your body is artificially going through that primary response so that it's ready to do that secondary response, okay? Artificial passive immunity is when you get antibodies to something. This would be like an antitoxin or an antivenom. So let's say you go out hiking, you go out hiking, you stumble across a rattlesnake or a spider, it bites you, and uh-oh, now you have the toxin going through your system. They rush you to the hospital, and what they're going to do is give you an antibody to block that toxin so it doesn't cause you to shut down, doesn't cause anticoagulation, and doesn't cause your heart to shut down. What that antibody does is it blocks the toxin, and prevents it from doing what it does. And so that's that neutralization, okay? You're not making memory in this case, you're getting antibodies, but you're not making memory. So it's a shot of antibodies to protect you. So again, I like to ask this question on all my tests, the difference between natural active, natural passive, artificial active, and artificial passive. So make sure you understand what each one, which each one is an example of each one, okay? So break that down, use flashcards here, do other things. and so. It's, it's really easy to get confused, but just kind of keep them straight and you can kind of think about it the, that same way. Natural is getting naturally exposed. Artificial is getting a shot. And then the active versus passive. Active means you're making memory. Passive, you're not making memory. And you can kind of put those together and think of the examples that go along with it. Okay? All right. So again, passive immunity 
And immunization is when you receive globulin antibodies or gammaglobulin or anything extracted from pooled blood. And again, this can be the treatment of choice when preventing measles, hepatitis A, using antibodies in uh, giving immunodeficient patients. We also have sera from horses, which also fights diphtheria, botulism, spider and snake bites. These are the antivenom. And again, it acts immediately, but the protection only lasts for a short time. You do not make memory. So this is passive artificial memory, okay? Or passive, partial active, or partial artificial immunization or immunity because you don't make memory and you get a shot from this case, okay? And these are all the different examples of those things. Okay, vaccination is artificial active immunity because what happens is you get a shot of something that shot then causes an immune response for you to have active memory made. Okay, so think of this, you get a shot every year, get that shot, it helps you make an immune response, that immune response sets you up for that secondary response so when you come in contact with that pathogen, you fight it right away and you don't even realize you get it. You don't get sick, okay? You get a powerful sustained response to the uh, antigen when you come in contact with it, okay? How do we make vaccines? Well, some vaccines are killed whole cells. These are in, or inactivated viruses. Sometimes these are used, and so these were really the first generation vaccines that were out there. Most of the vaccines we get today, like the flu vaccine and that, are live attenuated cells or viruses, and it will tell you, and again, these require refrigeration. So if you ever go and get a shot of something and they pull it out of the refrigerator, it's most likely to be alive and attenuated, okay? So that's the thing. We do now have some newer generation vaccines that are energetic or antigenic molecules that are derived from bacteria cells and viruses, and we'll talk about those. And then now even the latest generation ones are genetically engineered. And so these things are genetically engineered in the lab. You use those to fight off things and we can use these. And these are a little bit safer than using live and attenuated. Some have pros and cons. We'll look at those things very quickly and just kind of talk about these different types of vaccines. So let's take a look at vaccines real quick. Okay, so here's how they construct the vaccine. So let's take a look at this first. There are a variety of ways to produce vaccines. Traditionally, vaccines have consisted of killed or inactivated pathogens. A second traditional approach is to use an attenuated strain of the pathogen. During attenuation, the pathogen loses its virulence, but retains many of its antigens and is therefore able to elicit an immune response. Subunit or acellular vaccines consist of selected components from the pathogen, such as a surface structure, an internal macromolecule, or the flagellum. Recombinant vaccines are produced by cloning the gene for a structure, such as a surface protein from a pathogen, into a host microorganism. For example, the gene for a surface protein of the hepatitis B virus has been cloned into a yeast cell. The yeast produces the virus surface protein, which can be purified from the growth medium of the yeast and used as a vaccine. Okay, so this video does a really good job of just showing you the different types. And so I, I briefly explain them. You have the heat killed, you have the live attenuated, you have the subunit, which are the just pieces of the bacteria or virus that are used to make the vaccine. And now you have these latest ones, which are the recombinant vaccines, which are pieces of DNA put into different cells, which make a protein. They inject that into you, and then you make these different proteins so your body can respond to those. And again, some of these have better benefits. Some of them have some cons to them and things like that. We'll take a look at some of these different pros and cons to all these different vaccines. So again, what qualifies as an effective vaccine? Again, it should have a low level of adverse effects. I mean, the worst thing you want is just a sore arm, but you don't want to have an immune response that is so bad that it could kill a person, obviously. Okay, you want to make sure that it protects against the natural wild forms of the pathogen. So that make a good vaccine. Again, you really like to stimulate both the B and T cells in those responses. Should have long-term memory effects, okay? Shouldn't require numerous doses or boosters. You don't want to have to keep going back every six months to get a booster. And again, should be inexpensive. Your insurance should cover it and that it's not millions and millions of dollars to get this vaccine. The other thing is you want to make sure that it's a long shelf life, easy to administer like a shot, 
and that most people will be able to get and get a, get the shot pretty readily. Okay. Uh, and again, this is probably what they're doing right now with the Zika virus. And so you've probably have heard of the Zika virus that's out there and that I'm sure there are now companies looking at this already, trying to come up with a vaccine, come up with something that's going to cause, uh, again, artificial immunity towards it. So that even if you get by a mosquito that has the virus, you will be protected. So you have the secondary response and you don't get sick from it or you don't get sick or it doesn't pass on to your your unborn child that you know that th where the most complications are coming from so that's that's the thing that we're looking for in these viruses or in these vaccines okay so the first one is the killer and activated vaccines and so this is where you basically take the microbe and you kill it with either high heat or chemicals they're dead organisms and again they can cause an immune response the problem with these is they tend to have to have a large dose associated with them because they're killed. So you have to take this relatively large dose of them or you have to have multiple boosters for these things to happen. Again, these aren't the best vaccines out there. They do work and there's some examples of those out there that have worked really well, like for smallpox and other things. But for the most part, these things aren't the best ones because they they don't work as a natural type of um, uh, natural exposure would. And so I'll we'll show you some better examples of that here in just a second. So it has some benefits, but it also has some cons associated with that. Another one is the live attenuated, and this is where we actually attenuate, but it's still alive. So a lot of times our vaccines are in this shape. And so what they do is they take the live strain and then they remove the virulence factors that cause the problems. They then inject you with this live strain, this live strain, and it behaves just like a live strain would. It grows inside of you and multiplies, and your immune system responds to it just like it would a normal live organism. And so what's nice about this is that you don't need a lot of, uh, lot of injections with these things. You don't need a lot of boosters with these things, and so they provide a really good response. And so this is like getting responded to almost with a live pathogen. And so there are some wonderful things that go along with this. And so it eliminates the various factors and you get this live shot. Our flu vaccines, this is how a lot of our flu vaccines are made. You get a live attenuated strain. The strain behaves just like a live virus would. It grows, it multiplies in cells. Your body responds to it, but it doesn't kill the cells, okay? And so that's a good thing. And so you eliminate it, you get exposure to it, and now you're protected. And so that's how most of our vaccines work. Good advantages of it, again, are it multiplies and produces an infection, but not the disease. You confer lifelong lasting protection, and it usually requires fewer doses because, again, the virus or bacteria grow. These things have a normal immune response. You make memory to it. Both your B and T cells get activated, and while you get it without getting the disease. The problem is, is that it requires special storage. So a lot of our vaccines have to be stored in the refrigerator, and so this can be tough if you're trying to get Lots of people vaccinated and, you know, you're in areas where you don't have refrigeration. It can be transmitted to other people in the rare occasions that this thing could be transmitted. And the biggest thing is that it could possibly revert back to the original strain. So it could get people sick. So this is sometimes what happens when people get the flu strain and sometimes they get sick from it. Typically, they get a less of a degree of what they would get from the normal flu, but it can cause like flu-like symptoms. And so sometimes this it is. This is what happens. Sometimes those flu-like responses are just actually your normal immune response causing you to have flu-like symptoms. And so that's because you get this flu-like response and you get those systems. And so there are some disadvantages to it. Some people can't be vaccinated if their immune system is not healthy enough. They can't be vaccinated with these things because we worry about these uh, viruses or bacteria actually causing disease in those people. So you will see some people can't get these strains because their immune system isn't healthy enough to receive these things. And so that's another disadvantage with these type of diseases or vaccines. Okay, the next one is the antigenic molecules. This is called the subunit. And again, we can use subunits of capsules, specific proteins and exotoxins that can be used. And again, we can take them from cultures and give them to them. And again, some of the uh, things that are nice about it, again, you're not talking about a live vaccine again. Storage is a little bit easier in this case. You're not talking about mutating back to the original virus or bacteria. And again, these guys will stimulate immunity. Problem is, is that it may take a larger dose. 
Uh, sometimes you might not get the full robust response with these things. And so again, it can be a catch 22 on these things, but they, they are generally effective. And these are some of these newer generations that we see of vaccines that are out there. Okay. And then the genetically engineered, this is where we take pieces of the genome, put it into a plasmid and then stick it into things like yeast. And so some of these guys are now being made in yeast cells. We then purify the protein we, or we can ingest the yeast into people and then cause the protein to be made and then you make an immune response and again you make a response to the antigen but the pathogen isn't present and so we see this this is seen a lot of times in the hepatitis b and so if you're allergic to yeast this can be a problem so obviously you can't have the yeast in you but it does work pretty well without getting the normal virus that we see and sometimes we actually see these trojan horse vaccines where you can take genetic material and put it into a live uh, carrier non-pathogen like E. coli or some of these other ones. And we can see we have some experimental vaccines for AIDS, herpes, uh, simplex 2, leprosy, and tuberculosis that are being tried. And again, these subunits or these uh, uh, genetically engineered are actually taking pieces of the DNA or RNA and putting it into other organisms to create these proteins, which then your body can recognize and respond to. Okay. And again, here's some DNA vaccines. This is a recombination of the DNA. And then human cells picking up the DNA and making proteins causing the B and T cells to respond. So injecting the pathogen or the DNA of the pathogen with the plasmid itself. So not even putting into yeast, but just taking the DNA itself and injecting it into you. And then your body makes the protein and then those, those proteins cause an immune response to that. And again, we're seeing some experimental vaccines with Lyme disease, hepatitis C, herpes, influenza, and tuberculosis all being made this way as well. And so again, don't know if any of these have come on the market as of yet, but some of these newer guys, there are some, there are some potential cures for like hepatitis C now. And I think some of those are based on the, this technology. And so don't quote me on that for sure. But if you look at some of these new treatments out there for hepatitis C, I think they're based on some of these technologies that are out there. Okay, so that's some of these newer things that are out there. So here are some of the different types of vaccines where they're injected and how many times you should get injected with them and that stuff. And you can see in different lists. And I'm not going to go through them with you guys, but if you're curious, you can pause the video here and take a look at these things. But again, I'm just having you guys take a look and see what you see here. Okay. So here's a concept check. So if the capsule of the pathogen is being used as a vaccine, we call this as, or call this as an attenuated vaccine, a cellular vaccine, a kill vaccine, or a combinant vaccine. So what would you call cause this? It's also known, well, I'll bring that up in a second. So take a guess and see. Okay, if you said a cellular vaccine or subunit vaccine, you would be correct. And so like I said, I was gonna mention, this is a subunit vaccine because a capsule is a piece of the, of the bacteria that can be used as a subunit. That subunit can cause an immune response. And so we call that a cellular vaccine or a subunit vaccine. Good job, you got it right. Now recombinant is DNA, killed is the killed host, and attenuated is one that is still alive but doesn't have the virulence response to it. All right, so obviously we can have some problems or uh, the router administration issues. So again, most are done by injection. There are some that are now oral or nasal. So some of the flu vaccines now are nasal and they seem to be pretty effective because that's how flu is spread through the nose and the mouth. And so they can be pretty effective that way. Some require an adjuvant, which is again, it's kind of like in the sense of the haptin, it's too small, you don't get a great immune response. So what we do is we add more chemicals to it to cause a really overwhelming response, or not overwhelming, but a, a response that would be, that would create memory. And so that's important as well. Again, there's stringent requirements for development of vaccines, obviously. So that's why in the vaccines, again, are one of those things that isn't a big money maker for companies. And so unless you come up with something very specific and you're the only one that makes it, there's not a lot of money to be had. So a lot of companies don't look at vaccines as a way to go. And so you only see a few companies out there that actually make vaccines. Again, the vaccine has to be more benefit than risk. You don't want to get sick from the vaccine. And so again, that's why you have all these trials and other things to make sure that it's safe. And again, obviously there can always be side effects. You can have injection sites, so soreness in the arm can create fever, can create allergies. Sometimes you get rare, rarely back mutations. 
and some can lead to neurological effects. So you may sign off that sheet when you get the flu vaccine every year and not really pay attention to it. But one of the things you can get is that uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is basically where the virus or the vaccine can cause an inflammation of your brain and can cause you to have basically inflammation of the brain and can lead to either hemorrhaging or some other neurological effects. And it can be a serious uh, consequence to the vaccine. I'm saying that happens in less than 1%, but they do make sure you read through that so that you do know that you're taking a chance. So if you've had any, obviously any effects before, then obviously I wouldn't recommend getting the vaccine again, but very rarely these things can occur. So just be careful in those things. And if you do notice anything, make sure you go and contact your doctor right away because these can lead to serious effects if you do feel any of these things go on after you receive a vaccine. Okay, so why do we get vaccinated? The reason why we get vaccinated, not only to have that secondary response, but the idea of developing this, what do we call this herd immunity. And I like to show this picture because I, this is what herd immunity is. You have the strongest member of the herd protecting the weakest, okay? And the idea is, is that when you get in, uh, a population immunized, that they will protect the ones that are not immunized. And that really means the ones that can't be immunized, not the ones that don't choose to be, because that's just being, I think, selfish in that case. But again, why we get vaccinated is to protect those that can't be vaccinated, and that's the herd immunity, okay? So let's look at this example over here. So let's say no one gets immunized with the latest vaccine that comes out and two people get it. Well, what happens is it becomes very contagious and it can spread to the population and now most of the population gets this. Okay, if we develop a vaccine and most people are vaccinated, what it will do is even though those two people still get the disease, we can protect most of the population because it can't be passed to other people. And that's the idea is that you're protecting the herd. Those that can't be vaccinated are protected because those that are vaccinated can't spread the disease. And that works well in theory, but it doesn't always work. And so we saw with the measles outbreak uh, two years ago with the measles is that when you see people that choose not to get vaccinated, they can spread the disease. And that goes to other people then. And unfortunately, the consequence is those that can't be vaccinated. And so those that choose not to be vaccinated, don't get vaccinated, get the disease and then can pass it on to those that can't be vaccinated, and that's where the consequences lie. Okay, if you choose not to be vaccinated and you get the disease, that, that's your own responsibility for getting that disease. However, for those people that cannot get vaccinated because they have some immune problem, they may have cancer or some other side effects that are going on and can't be vaccinated, that's really not their fault. They can't be vaccinated with it, and we're trying to protect them by being all vaccinated around it. And so when you don't get vaccinated, you're taking a chance not only for yourself, but all those that can't be vaccinated as well. So I want you to remember that if you choose not to get vaccinated, you're taking that choice in your own hands for getting the disease, but also think of the consequences down the road, that you're spreading that to other people who can't be vaccinated and can cause potentially a serious uh, effect on them in their life as well. Okay, and so that's my little stern warning to you guys that choose not to get vaccinated. You're not only doing it to yourself, but you also think about the people that can't be vaccinated that you may be affecting as well. Okay. All right. Here's the, again, recommended immunization schedule. And again, I don't, I'm not going to ask this on a test or anything, but this just kind of shows you where you should be uh, immune or where you should be vaccinated and that stuff. And again, some start very early on within the first first month or right at birth, hepatitis B and then and the, that, but then again, some start within two or three months. And again, there may be some pros or cons of that. I'm not going to get into that today. But again, I, I would choose, if, if I had children, I would choose to have them vaccinated. I think it's a responsible choice because why should they get diseases that we should have eliminated like measles and mumps and things like this? Why should they get those diseases when we have perfectly safe healthy vaccines for people to get out there. And I don't want to start a controversy or anything else, but I think that's a choice that we should make is getting vaccinated because I think that protects people in doing that. And again, if you don't like that opinion, you can have your own opinion on that. But I think, you know, the good outweighs the bad in these situations and that you should get vaccinated for these things. And that's getting on my little soapbox. So I'll step off now and be the, you know, conscientious teacher in this case. But like I said, if I had the choice, I would vaccinate. I've had vaccines perfectly healthy in that. And I think, you know, if I had kids, I would definitely vaccinate them as well. Okay, so on with the next thing. 
All right, so for our summary, we talked to today specifically about the third line of defense. This involves the specific and acquired throughout our lifetimes. This involves the T cells and the B cells. Remember, B cells mature in the bone marrow. They go out to the lymph nodes and they attack outside of cells. T cells, they mature in the thymus and they attack inside the cells, okay? The big thing about them is they make memory. So when you come in contact with something, you remember those infections that you had and you respond to them again and again and again when you come in contact with it again, okay? B cells, like I talked about, are made and mature in the bone marrow. Mature means they gain the receptor in the bone marrow. They produce antibodies, which will bind to specific antigens, and the primary response and secondary response to infection. So remember, the primary response is the delay, and then you get the little IgM and the IgG. The secondary response, when you come in contact with that antigen the second time, you make that overwhelming amniotic response right away. You respond to it, you don't get sick, and you stay healthy. And so that's the important thing with that secondary response. The T cells made in the bone marrow, but then mature, gain the receptor in the thymus. And again, we have the two types, the helper T cells and the cytotoxic T cells. The helper T cells help with presentation and turn on the rest of the system. The cytotoxic T cells, once they get turned on, go and attack cells that are infected internally. So you want to go and kill those infected cells, also cancer cells, okay? And then we talked about immunity. Make sure you know the difference between passive and active. Active means making memory. Passive means you just get an antibody and you respond, but no memory is made. And then natural and artificial. Natural is when you get exposed to something naturally. Artificial is when you get a shot. And again, you can put those together. Natural active is when you get sick. Natural passive is when you get antibodies from mom through breastfeeding. Uh, artificial active is when you get a vaccine and you make memory. Artificial passive is when you get an antitoxin or antivenom to block the disease that you have at that current time. And it blocks it and you don't make memory to it. Okay. Vaccines, we talked about the ways that these vaccines are made. Again, it's an artificial way to be exposed. So you have that primary response. So you're ready to go to get that secondary response so you don't get sick. And then again, the B and T cells make memory to the vaccine so you don't get sick to it. And that's the idea. Okay, so we've come to the end. I know this is a long video, but I think it's really interesting to talk about these different things. Hopefully you got something out of it. So if anything, you just remember B cells make antibody, T cells kill cells, and you remember where they're made and that stuff. And I think that's the main goal of this, and that is different than the other uh, types of immunity. Hopefully you got something out of this. I'll see you next time, and thank you for watching.